So you're telling me two of the four most underrated college football teams in the country are in the ACC. Okay. You are Locked On ACC, your daily podcast on the Atlantic Coast Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Shout out to the everydayers for making Locked On ACC your first listen and your first watch each and every day. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts. We're free on YouTube. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. He is Kenton Gibbs from Locked On Wolfpack. I am Alex Dono from Locked On Canes. On this episode, we will discuss quarterbacks. There are some ACC quarterbacks who are possibilities who will silence their critics in 2024. Uh, we're looking at a certain Syracuse quarterback with an opportunity to do that this year. Uh, the team that I cover, Miami, has got a change of leadership coming at the very top. The university president is on the way out. Will the next university president potentially be aggressive on matters like conference realignment? But, Kenton, I want to start with most underrated teams in college football. So pro football focus, and this was uh, th this metric was uh, created on the college side by Max Chadwick, who's, uh, who's a very good dude. Uh, they consider the four most underrated teams in college football heading into this season to be two of them in the Big 12, two of them in the ACC. From the Big 12, UCF and West Virginia – from the ACC, SMU, and Virginia Tech. So we'll focus on the ACC side. And actually, Kenton, something I want to say here, I, I think the secret is getting out when it comes to Virginia Tech. We'll talk about SMU as well, but I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time you and I, several weeks ago, talked about betting totals over-unders heading into the 2024 season, yeah. Virginia Tech, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, their, their over-under was seven and a half wins. As of Wednesday afternoon, I go back on FanDuel, and Virginia Tech is now at eight and a half. So apparently yeah. a lot of people betting on the sports books are listening to Locked on ACC because we've been telling you, don't let the Hokies sneak up on you this year. Well, listen, we're not going to talk about all the, the action that the national media has taken from Locked on ACC. We're not looking at anybody in particular. But with that in mind, very seriously, Virginia Tech is a team that is – they're in a position to do good things this year because they're starting to gain the identity back. It's not the old Virginia Tech identity. It's slightly different, but this is a, a new and adapted version that can be just as good. You think about Virginia Tech and you always thought about vaunted defense, great special teams. But what if I told you now you're looking at a situation where you have explosive quarterback play right. and very agile defenses, right? That's how you get around. That's how you win. You can look at Virginia Tech's defense and say they're undersized, but you could also look at them and say they're going to have a quickness advantage on almost every team they play. That's just the reality of the, the personnel that they've stacked defensively. The question about Virginia Tech is going to be how well do they hold up against the run defensively, offensively, can the weapons get open enough, and can Kyron Jones find them? He was not a guy who I would say was one read, pull it, and run, but I don't think that he held on in the pocket long enough sometimes to kind of, all right, I'm going from we read one to two to two to three to three to four. All right, four is open. Let's hit him. I don't think that he did that enough to get this team to where they wanted to be at, but you combine his talent, Bishaw Tootin's talent, a defense that, again, while they are undersized, let them get you behind the sticks and you'll find out just how massive that speed and quickness advantage is. You combine that with a schedule that is, it's softer than marshmallows that have been chilling in hot chocolate for about a week. So, <laughs> you know, you combine all those factors and you could be very easily looking at a situation where that seven and a five indeed turns out to be too low because again, right. they don't get the national credit and that schedule, they could that could mesh to make something special up in Blacksburg. Yeah, strength of schedule is going to be a huge factor for both of these teams, for Virginia Tech and SMU. Uh, and it's it's an important metric that people don't talk about a whole lot. Now, it's a double-edged sword because it, you know, trying to predict exactly how easy someone's schedule is in June is can be a fool's errand because some Absolutely. teams are going to surprise you. It's like, wait, that I thought that'd be a really easy game, not so easy. But listen, you can obviously, you know, base your strength of schedule metrics based on 
what a team did last year in combination with how much talent they lost, how much talent they acquired. And, you know, for example, on their on their schedules, Virginia Tech and SMU this year, uh, you know, we've talked this week about the Phil Steele College Football Preview Magazine, which dropped earlier this week. Uh, in national strength of schedule, he's got Virginia Tech at number 67 in the country and SMU at number 76. You're going to be hard-pressed to find easier schedules than that for Power 4 teams, right? I look at the Hokie schedule, for, sure. for example, Kenton. You know, they open up... Big uh, big SEC showdown against Vanderbilt. They've got Marshall <laughs> on the schedule. They've got Old Dominion. They've got Rutgers. Uh, they're on the road at Miami. They've got Stanford. They've got Boston College. They've got Georgia Tech. They've got Syracuse. Uh, they do have Clemson. That will be a home game. They've got Duke and they've got Virginia. So you could you could obviously argue that hey they may, maybe three wins three losses there uh, potentially maybe only two losses if they pull off an upset along the way. Yeah, and the thing about this team is very simple, right? They are in a prime position to have a good year based on schedule. You still got to show up and play the games. And I know that I've talked about deficiencies in terms of, of the ability to stop the run, and you think, well, most teams aren't very good at running the ball. But here's the reality. You will find out that people, these coaches are better at exploiting weaknesses than most of us give them credit for. Like that, that's just the reality. These guys are making hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for a reason. Yeah. That's that's going to happen. Teams are going to say, where's the lack of depth at? You know what? Forget it. We might have to uh, dedicate some extra bodies to the box and make somebody not named Tootin or make somebody who um, Kyron Jones has to throw the ball to beat us. And I think that Virginia Tech has – some quality wide receivers in certain situations. I think they have guys that can go up and win 50-50 balls. I don't think they have a ton of guys that can get a lot of separation. I really and truly don't when I look at their roster. And if that's the case, if you've got lower corners and you can say, you know what, mm, I think that we'll take our chances with that, that could create an entirely different dynamic. Because I think while Bishaw Tootin is, is mostly viewed as this dynamic kick return or punt return, all that stuff, that man is electric with the ball in his hands regardless of where he's at, regardless of where he's at. So if you can create a situation where you force the ball out of his hands and say, Kyron Jones, we won't let you beat us with your legs either. We're going to take away everything on the ground. Y'all got to beat us through the air. There are a lot of questions that will arise for this team. That's just the fact of the matter. And then you get to the other part of if you get them down, how do they react then? Because that's a de facto eighth man in the box. When you are down a significant amount and you cannot just run the ball and be play your regular game and you're forced to chuck it, yeah. what happens then? So, you know, this is this is a Virginia Tech team that they have a good schedule, they have talent, they have many things working in their favor, but it's still the questions still loom large because their weaknesses, we don't go into detail about them and we don't make them their main features, but they do exist. They do exist. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out for them. Yeah, and you know Virginia Tech, they do have the luxury of continuity. Uh, they're Absolutely. number two in the country, according to Phil Steele, number two in the entire country in percentage of returning talent, number one in the ACC, of course, in that regard. Uh, a lot of continuity also with SMU. Now, now the continuity obviously comes from their roster. Their conference is a huge change for SMU this year, but uh, you know, Rhett Lashley is a, a great offensive mind. Their head coach there, Preston Stone, their quarterback, comes off an excellent season. They've got a uh, three-headed running back attack. They've actually got at least projected to be one of the better offensive lines in the country. Uh, they look good on paper uh, in that area. And, you know, another another pretty easy schedule there for SMU. Uh, I'll take a look at, at their opponents for this year. They they open at Nevada. They play against HCU. I'm not even sure what, what HCU is. Is that uh, Holy Cross? Oh, yeah, probably is Holy Cross. Yeah, it just says HCU on there, Holy Cross. Yeah, they, they've, got, <laughs> they've got BYU at home, uh, TCU at home, uh, Florida State at home, at Louisville, at Stanford, at Duke, home against Pitt, home against Boston College, at Virginia, at, uh, and home against Cal. That, that's, uh, that's SMU schedule. But I, I think the big question, Kenton, for SMU is, um, how how much of their success, they were a nine-win team and a conference champion last year, how much of that is going to translate now that they're in the Power Five? I think that's going to be the big adjustment for that team. 
Oh, absolutely. And beyond that, I'm sorry, that is not uh, Holy Cross. HCU is, I believe, Houston Central or something along those lines. Oh. This is a university wow. I've never seen in my life. The HCU Huskies, which well, is better win that game. Yeah, they, they ought to. They ought to. But with that being said, I look at this, I look at this team and I you know how how big of a Rhett Lashley fan I am. I've talked about it yeah. publicly many a times. I think he's special. Y'all know how much I love SMU. Free Sherwood Blood, free the guys over there. But Pony Express, baby. It, it's it's time. It's time. What, what was it? The the gold the gold Trans Am? What kind of car was that? That uh... Hey, listen, listen, I remember seeing him in that picture with the white Trans Am in the middle of that core fit. I said, yeah. Oh, he putting it on. But On the field, they absolutely do have a lot of talent in a lot of ways. I question how good is that offensive line. That's my biggest question because it's it's a difference when you talk about, and I I hate to use this as an example, but this is the last example of somebody jumping levels. Shador Sanders, when he talked about the difference between Colorado and Jackson State, he said the defensive linemen are different. It's it's different. You have less time. They get there a little bit quicker. They stop to run a little bit. They're they're a little bit different than what they used to be. That is a situation where, despite the fact they're supposed to be one of the better groups in the country, where was one of the main areas that Rhett Lashley addressed in the portal? Offensive line. Yeah, right. So that, to me, it, it. I'm not saying that I'm worried about them and I think they're going to be bad. I'm not saying that. The question is, how good are they? Because moving up a level, I don't think it's ever easy, but that's a question. And then, obviously, you have an offensive head coach. Who is your defense? That becomes a question as well. How does a defense that was middle of the road last year in the American hold up against much better offenses? And and that's no disrespect to the American. It's just a, a fact of life that you're looking at much bigger budgets, physically bigger players. You're looking at a very different situation. So who is their defense? You know what I mean? Who? How do they hold up against some of these teams that have, have – had, like you said, with the continuity of a Virginia Tech, the physicality of a Boston College, or Miami, another team that prides themselves on being physical, downhill, no frills. How do you hold up against those situations is the question that you ask yourself for an SMU. And I will say this for SMU. Another great part about them being an expansion team and out towards the West, they get to play all the West Coast teams. So that's another thing that works out for their favor because with all due respect, I love Ott from Cal. I really think that Anamayor is a really good receiver. Other than those two guys, I'm not sure how many guys those teams have that are going to play on Sundays. So they've got some things working for them. They've got some things working against them. My biggest concerns, offensive line, defensive depth. What does it look like? Well, coming up next here on Locked on ACC, up to this point, Miami has been uh, not really aggressive whatsoever in, you know, possibly challenging the ACC's grant of rights or exploring realignment. Could that change with a leadership change at the top? You want to keep it locked right here. We're only getting started on this brand new episode of Locked on ACC. My friends, the only ticket service that Kenton Gibbs and I use is game time. The Game Time app is absolutely incredible, including the opportunity you have to find the best last-minute deals. Tickets right before the game or concert starts. Sometimes you can get tickets there even an hour after an event begins. And guys, if you're going to NBA Finals games, how cool would it be to go to a game? Well, Game Time makes getting NBA Finals tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off with killer last-minute deals. All in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. Guys, on the flash deals, you can save even more with exclusive in app deals on select seats ahead of the game or the event. The all in pricing is a game changer. It shows you the total upfront, no surprise, and hidden fees at checkout. The views from your seat, you can get a panoramic view in the app right before you buy. Uh, They have the lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thank you so much for making this episode of Locked on ACC your first listen and your first watch today. 
Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Alex Dono and Kenton Gibbs with you. So, Kenton, I uh, I, I had heard that this was going to happen at some point soon. I didn't expect it to happen this soon. I, I thought that uh, the University of Miami president was going to get through the centennial, which is coming up, the 100-year anniversary, and then, you know, ride off into the sunset after that. But I, I got the news on, uh, on Wednesday afternoon that University of Miami president, Dr. Julio Frank, is actually leaving to become the chancellor of UCLA. So he he's out the door. Now... I think there's opportunity here on a number of fronts, Kenton. I'm not not going to bore people with the academics of my alma mater, but uh, under under Dr. Frank's watch, the overall academics had slipped a little bit. Um, a big area that he addressed, because he's actually the former Minister of Health of Mexico, so he's got that mm -hmm. healthcare background. He he really Im helped improve the, uh, the the healthcare system. Miami owns a chain of hospitals down here. The university does. Uh, that became very profitable under his watch. The medical school benefited from that. Uh, his approach to athletics was an interesting one because um, I, I never got the sense that he took personal interest in sports or really understood how all that stuff worked, but he did have a, a pretty hands-off approach with the athletic department and his top advisors. He kind of allowed them to increase the budgets and spend more on football and basketball facilities, on assistant coaches and head coaches in Mario Cristobal's case, which, which I did not mind. But I have to wonder, you know, how much of Miami's kind of um, very non-aggressive attitude towards that ACC grant of rights that we talk so much about the un the un you know seemingly unwillingness to try to challenge it the way that Florida State and Clemson and possibly North Carolina are doing. I wonder who who the next permanent university president is if they take more of an aggressive interest in trying to increase athletic revenues right through exploring right. other conferences now. Miami currently has an acting president. I don't know if this is going to be the guy that they appoint permanently, but the acting president, Joe Echeverria, actually very interested in athletics. He was instrumental in increasing those budgets and hiring Mario Cristobal. He had been Julio Frank's kind of right-hand man and top advisor. He's the acting president right now. I don't know if he's going to get the gig permanently, but if he does, I feel like that's someone who will not leave any stone unturned when it comes to exploring, you know, the most ways to make revenue possible in this new era of college athletics. Yeah, I think that the laissez-faire approach is not necessarily what what is um, going to work today for a lot of universities, even if you are not actively making the biggest move or the biggest jump to sue and get out. You still need to be actively exploring. Is that worthwhile? I think that that's something that a brand as large as Miami is and as big as Miami is, because I'll be very honest. Growing up as a kid, now I was born in 95. You do the math on that. When I was coming of age and falling in love with football, Warren Sapp is the reason I always wanted to wear 99. Now, granted, he didn't wear 99 in Miami, but you get my point. He's, Pros, a, yeah. he's, a, he's a Miami guy, you know what I mean? And there's a long story tradition there. And so that's a massive brand, and I think that it would do them some good to look into it. So what am I saying in terms of the president here? What I'm saying is having a president who takes more of an interest in sports, who is willing to push the envelope in certain ways in sports, that's absolutely beneficial. And to pretend like it isn't is a fool's errand because again, I'll, I'll say this as simply as I can, right? Having a president, having the main decision maker, the person who is most responsible for pulling the trigger, deciding whether or not we spend the money, deciding whether or not we do the, the exit or look for a new conference. Having that person deeply interested in sports, yeah. I guarantee you, as sure as the sun rises on the east and sets on the west, just like uh, the former president had a, a background in history and health, and then all of a sudden the hospitals get better, the med school gets better, guess, which, guess what's going to happen if the new guy's a sports guy? Take a while, right. guess. Come on, come with me now. If he was a if he was a business guy, what do you think would happen, right? School, if he yeah. if if if, the, if he was a, a formal psychology guy and he's all about organizational therapy and things like, what do you think would happen? So if we're looking at sports and the guy who is a sports guy being the right hand man and acting president, I don't think this could be a bad thing for Miami in terms of uh, the the effect on sports if the acting president who was the right hand advisor and leader in sports right. becomes their 
permanent leader in terms of the university overall. Right. And and that's why, you know, I've been telling people I in the short term, no, nothing, nothing's going to change, at least not in the negative, because right. you know, the, the guy the guy who's at the wheel right now is he, he's a Miami alum and he's a big Miami sports fan. I'm definitely going to be looking to see who they appoint to be the, the permanent successor, wh- whether that's Echeverria or somebody else, mm-hmm. what they're like you said, you hit the nail on the head, what their background is also where they've been before. Right. Because if, if anyone thinks that, hey, Miami might maybe be interested in in the Big Ten if they maybe bring somebody in who's got a history of being a former president or administrator in the Big Ten or in the SEC, what have you. You would definitely try to read the tea leaves there. And, you know, listen, at the the end of the day, I also I don't know how much direct influence the university president will have over something like conference realignment, because it's worth noting, Kenton, that like if you look at the Florida State lawsuit, for example, the plaintiff, it's not the university president. The plaintiff is the board of trustees of Florida mm-hmm. State, right? So again, I don't know. Is that something the university president signed off on? Is that something that they did on their own? I would think there would be some chemistry there between the university president and the board of trustees. But again, I, I don't know directly how influential a, a president would be on that. But it's definitely going to be something to monitor because I, I think anytime you look at a leadership change, you know, North Carolina, UNC just had one. They, they've got a new chancellor there uh they they seem to maybe be exploring being more aggressive to trying to get out of the acc i would have to wonder if if may, maybe miami would follow suit but again i won't know until i see who the permanent successor is yeah and that's that's definitely it's it's tough to jump the gun and say one way or another hey this is going to be positive for athletics this is going to be a negative for athletics because we just don't know there are lots of of uh, variables in this thing but i will say if the acting president becomes the president I would expect an uptick in Miami sports. I would buy stock in Miami sports because, again, you got a sports guy, right? And that uptick may not be easy. It may not be comfortable. It may include some incumbents seeing their way out of the door. It may include some some mainstays at Miami, um, you know, no longer being those in those positions and going back into a consultative role that older coaches get relegated. Oh, I'm sorry. Older coaches volunteer to go into Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But, you know, either way you you cut it or slice it, this is a situation where, again, a sports person will lean more into sports. And if this is not a sports guy, I still believe that the acting president will still be kept on as an advisor because I would say that overall Miami sports as a whole has never been as relevant outside of football, of course, because we know, you know, that's a that's a different beast. But baseball being good and being a team that's constantly viewed as an NCAA uh, tournament threat. You've got basketball making a Final Four, doing the things that they did um, in these past years, you know, since last year, which was a little bit of a struggle uh, because of injuries and things along those lines. You have multiple sports in Miami being really good that historically weren't. So, you know, all in all, I think that whether or not he stays as the full-time president or whether he slides back into his advisory for sports role, I think that this young man or this gentleman has done a fantastic job in his role. And I, I highly doubt that they would let him go because of it. Now he may go on to greener right. pastures and say, Hey, I want to be the main guy. I want to be the big baller and shot caller, but he's done a fantastic job in Miami. And I highly doubt that there's any incentive for them to get rid of him. You know, some people might listen to this conversation and say, wow, you guys just live in such a sports bubble, right? That there, you know, there are so many other factors when it comes to picking a university president. But I would argue that given given the state of college sports, uh, no matter who your university president or chancellor is, sports is more important than ever, Kenton, because you think yeah. about if you have specifically football, because football is the biggest cash cow, basketball to mm-hmm. a lesser extent, but, but what football – you're in you're in a power four conference. The opportunity that teams from especially obviously the Big Ten and SEC, but ACC and Big 12 as well, the opportunity you have to print money through your football program. Absolutely. It's never been this big before. So it's like, you know, when you talk about the – because really university presidents, one of their most important roles is fundraising and, and raising money. And then the previous Miami president did a lot through the medical system. It, it really built up their – their coffers through the hospital system, but it's like you have a similar opportunity with college sports these days. So it's definitely something that cannot go ignored. Uh, Here's another thing that can't go ignored. Uh, Quarterbacks in the ACC who have an opportunity to silence critics this year. My friends, you want to keep it locked on this brand new episode of Locked on ACC.
Thank you so much for making Locked On ACC your first listen and your first watch today. So, uh, Kenton, 24-7 Sports uh, put out an article uh, written by Carter Bonds um, about uh, college football quarterbacks poised to silence critics during the 2024 season. And I, I think this is a great place to start. And, you know, there are a couple of other ACC quarterbacks on the list. Maybe we can get to those later on this week. But uh, Kyle McCord at Syracuse, he, he has an opportunity, Kenton, because, yeah, he played for a powerhouse program that had a very good season last year in Ohio State. Not Michigan good, but Ohio State had a very good year last year. But Kyle McCord, who, you know, he transferred from the Ohio State University – to Syracuse, um, you know, for those of us who watched McCord all season last year, you saw a guy who didn't do a whole lot with great talent around him. But he wasn't the reason why Ohio State won double-digit games last year. In fact, you figure they may have run the table and possibly even beaten Michigan had they had, you know, a better quarterback under center. So he's built this reputation of a guy who did less with more. Now he goes to a program that uh, – what, well, what did I say? Oh, I, I mean, he's built a reputation as a guy who did less with more. That's the first time I've ever heard that one. Really? I mean, it's oh, true, though, right? It's I'm, true. You're, you're not wrong. I'm not, and, hey, and, and now he's going to a program that has less. So yeah. can he elevate yeah. the talent around him at Syracuse? So, and, and this is why and this is why anybody who listens to this show, Dono is a, I'm telling you, this man's going to be a legend in the game when it's all said and done. <laughs> For this reason, he's so intentional with his words. He said, the opportunity to silence critics. You are absolutely right, Dono. This is a massive opportunity. Outside of Aronde Gaston, I challenge you. Right. You and I both watch Syracuse football. You and I both watch ACC football. Name me three playmakers from, from Syracuse. You, you named the one that I could name. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. So <laughs> Kyle McCord has a hell of an opportunity to prove everybody wrong. If he throws for similar stats to what he did last year, even if – he is not excellent and perfect this year. He will have shut everybody up and said it wasn't a, a Buka, it wasn't Marvin Harrison Jr., it wasn't Osweiler, Marvin, it wasn't all these uh, playmakers out of the backfield. It was me. I was the guy. I was the glue. I was the one who was more than just a a serviceable point guard. I made plays. If he can do that, the question is, can he? I like Fran Brown. Love Aronde Gaston. I don't think he can. But if he does. Hey, I'll eat my crow. I ate my crow on, on Louisville last year. I didn't buy stock early, and by the time I wanted to buy stock, it was too late. And if Kyle McCord comes around and makes me eat crow again, I'm okay with that. I know Forever Orange Girl going to get on me in the comments about that. We love you, baby. We love you. But I'm not going to lie about this team. I think that Kyle McCord has the biggest opportunity out of every quarterback yeah. in the conference to, again, prove that he's that guy or show us why he had to transfer. One or the other is going to happen. Yeah, no, that's well said. Uh, so we'll talk about some more ACC quarterbacks on this list next time. Tyler Shuck uh, from Louisville made the list. But uh, if we start getting into that one, we're going to need oh, to boy. extend this episode. So we'll, we'll, oh, we'll get into that one next time. He is Kenton Gibbs from Locked On Wolfpack. Follow him on X at TGIF underscore Kenton. I'm Alex Dono from Locked On Canes. You can follow me at Alex Dono and we will talk to you next time on another episode of Locked on ACC, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.